Okay, hello everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, today we're continuing in the study of the book, uh, More Than a Carpenter. This is part three. Uh, if you did not see the first two episodes, uh, I, I hope you will go back and watch it from the beginning. Uh, but today we're going to pick up where we left off last time uh, on page 19. But before we get uh, started, let me ask, uh, I got Brother Ted on the telephone and Brother Joe here uh, in, the, in the hangout on the internet. So let me ask Joe just to introduce himself and say hi first. Yeah, this is uh, Joe from the Sebastian Dresden channel and uh, very excited to uh, uh, do a little study on one of the most influential books uh, ever written as far as I'm concerned in, in the past hundred years probably brought more people to the Lord than just about any other book other than the Bible that I can think of. So it's a, a real pleasure to study something most people have forgotten about. It's a little bit in the, about what, 30 years old, Luke? Something like that. But it's uh, entirely relevant and uh, an excellent resource. Well, I don't know the original date. Uh, I mean, uh, I know that I read it early on. I, I've been a, a Christian for 29 years. Uh, it'll be in December, it'll be 30 years. And I know that I read this early on. So uh, uh, let me see. It says 1977 was the original copyright. So exactly 30 years ago. And, and it says uh, here on this, it says 10 million well, it says more than 10 million in print worldwide, but that was probably many years ago. Who knows how many millions uh, now? But I, I do agree with your point. I, I do think it's probably one of the most influential books uh, for um, uh, the Bible and Jesus that uh, ever, ever was written. Uh, Brother Ted uh, is on the telephone. Uh, you want to introduce yourself and say hello? Uh, God's Truth Ministries, and uh, as Luke said, and Joe, you should uh, really give this a listen, and if you have a chance to pick up a copy of this book, it's been very influential to a lot of people over the years, and uh, give a listen, it's going to be a blessing. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, so let's begin uh, page 19, it's a very simple study, I'm just reading a little portion, and then we discuss it. Okay, this concept of forgiveness bothered me for quite a while because I didn't understand it. One day in, the philosophy, in a philosophy class answering a question about the deity of Christ, I quoted the above verses from Mark. A graduate assistant challenged my conclusion that Christ's forgiveness demonstrated his deity. He said that he could forgive someone and that that wouldn't demonstrate that he was claiming to be God. As I pondered what the graduate assistant was saying, it uh, struck me uh, why the religious leaders reacted against Christ. Yes, one can say, I forgive you, but that can be done only by the person who was sinned against. In other words, if you sin against me, I can say I forgive you, but that wasn't what Christ was doing. The paralytic had sinned against God the Father, and then Jesus, under his own authority, said, your sins are forgiven. Yes, we can forgive injuries committed against us, but in no way can anyone forgive sins committed against God except God himself. That is what Jesus did. Brother Joe, give you first chance to respond to that. Yeah, uh, it's it's interesting uh, to think about because yeah, we can we can forgive those who, who uh, trespass against us and and we're we're uh, told to do so. Uh, but uh, Christ uh, forgave the sins of mankind and could forgive anyone individually prior to his sacrifice. But what a price he paid! For the for forgiving uh, all of man, all of mankind's sins, past, present, future, uh, if if we would simply ask for it to receive the gift, 
but uh, I guess Christ could, uh, he, being being God, could uh, forgive sins prior to the cross. So, uh, very interesting. Hmm. Yeah, I really hadn't even thought about that last point you, you made, uh, forgiving before the, before the cross. But um, the, the the thing that is um, uh, so telling is is when we study the re reaction of the Jewish people when Jesus uh, said, "Your sins are forgiven." Uh, their reaction was they were appalled and they considered it to be blasphemy because the they understood uh, their belief was that, that only God was able to forgive sins uh, in the in the way that Jesus was doing it, and so uh, they they considered this uh, that in a, in a way Jesus was <clears throat> um, either claiming to be God or claiming the uh, a um, an ability that that only God has, and so they they reacted. Uh, with, with with anger and uh, just as so many other things that Jesus said uh, about himself, they reacted with anger and wanted to to kill him. And numerous times they they said they were going to kill him and or stone him. And, and as we said last time, this is exactly the reason that he was killed. Um, this is the reason that he was con uh, on trial and he was convicted for blasphemy because his claims about who he was being the son of God. So um, uh, I'm going to, I'll leave it up to Ted to, to interject whenever you feel like it rather than calling on you. So uh, if you feel like saying something anytime, brother, just speak up. Um, so let me, uh, let me read a little further then. It says, no wonder the Jews reacted. Oh, well, gosh, every time I say something, it seems like the very next point that Josh is making in the book is the, is the reaction, is the same point I made. Maybe I ought to read a little further before I respond. I don't know. <laughs> um, it says in the book here, no wonder the Jews reacted when a carpenter from Nazareth made such a bold claim. This power of, of Jesus to forgive sin is a startling example of his exercising a prerogative that belongs to God all, alone. Um, now, we know that, uh, um, for, let, let me talk a little bit about the idea of forgiving sin between, between us, you know. Uh, if um, if I did some offense against you, you have the ability to forgive me. Uh, but but your ability to forgive does not let a person off the hook in terms of the judgment and and uh, uh, their 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 fate and with the lake of fire and the second death. Uh, so I, I think this is a, a distinction too. Uh, we can forgive each other and make make peace with each other. But only God has the ability to forgive sins or accept the payment for sins in terms of the uh, the consequence of sin or the wages of sin. As the scripture says, the wages of sin is death. <clears throat> and I, I believe that applies to both the first death and the second death. The first death is something that we all uh, and anticipate some point uh, in our lives. So it comes to an end. <clears throat> but as we said last time, the Bible says there will be a resurrection of everybody who's ever lived and a judgment. And then those who never received the gift of eternal life, they suffer the second death. And, and, and the only thing that can solve that problem is the forgiveness of sins because of uh, Jesus' death on the cross for our sins. Uh, Brother Joe? Yeah, I, I, wish, uh, I wish Bill were here because he is so gifted at uh, knowing what scriptures I want to see. He usually brings them up before I even uh, uh, think of them. And uh, this is another one of those cases. You know, what, what occurs to me is that the priests of the time uh, were very much like the Catholic priests uh, of today or all through time. You know, they were in charge of uh, forgiving sin. Now, they didn't say that they forgave sin like God does, but they were his agent here on earth. 
if someone wanted to have their sins forgiven, they brought the lamb or they brought their sacrifice, their pigeon or whatever they, they could afford. And the priest would sacrifice the animal and sprinkle the blood over the person. And so he acted as God's agent on earth for forgiving the sins of the people. Uh, during the, especially pre-Reformation uh, in the Catholic Church, uh, they wanted that Bible hidden from people. Keep it in Latin. Uh, make it illegal for people to read it in their own tongue because they'd find out that they could go directly to God for forgiveness of sins. And uh, you can't uh, throw pennies in the penance dish uh, uh, at confessional for having the priest uh, pray for you and, uh, and forgive your sins as God's agent. And so, wow, the, the Jewish leaders of that day were being undermined. Not only is he acting as God, but he's, he's taken our spot, and, and he's not even uh, doing the rituals. That, 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 that's unforgivable, probably, in their minds. Back to you, Luke. Uh, yeah. Uh, let me see if I can find the verses. Uh, hmm. Oh, wow. Okay. A part's coming up that I'm anxious to talk about, but uh, um, when when Jesus uh, said, your sins are forgiven, arise and walk, um, and they, the Jewish people, uh, the, I, I'm assuming these were the religious leaders, the Pharisees, uh, they had this strong objection to him forgiving sin, and they said only God can forgive sin. And yet, as you said, um, it's part of uh, part of the main tenets of, of Roman Catholicism is their belief that uh, the priest has the uh, ability, power to forgive sins. You go into the confessional and the priest get uh, you confess your sins, and the priest tells you some kind of penance, sort of say so many Hail Marys, and and, uh, and he gives you forgiveness of sins or absolves i'm not sure if there's a distinction between absolving and forgiving but uh, so people believe that the priest has that power but um, the jews here were in this uh, discussion with jesus they, they said no you should not do that because only god has the power to forgive sins um, <clears throat> now let me uh, brother do you want to say anything further before i, I read on Uh, if you're talking to me, Luke, uh, no, no, uh, read on. All right, yeah, Joe. Yeah, I'm not going to, uh, Ted doesn't want to have a, re a part of the rotation, so uh, I'll just I'll just talk, call, talk to you, and then when Ted decides he wants to interject something, he, he can speak up if he wants. Okay, so now, also in the Gospel of Mark, we have the trial of <clears throat> Jesus, uh, that's in uh, Mark 14, verses 60 to 64. Those trial proceedings are one of the clearest references to Jesus' claims of deity. Quote, And the high priest arose and came forward and questioned Jesus, saying, Do you make no answer to what these men are testifying against you? But he kept silent and made no answer. Again, the high priest was questioning him and saying to him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? And Jesus said, I am, and you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And tearing his clothes, the high priest said, What further need do we have of witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. How does it seem to you? And they all condemned him to be deserving of death, unquote. We, I think I talked about this uh, in the last session yesterday uh, a little bit too. <clears throat> this was uh, one of the great uh, points in the Bible where um, you can see that Jesus is claiming to be God. And, and the Jews convicted him of that and said, He's, you've heard it with your, his, from his own mouth. Uh, and and uh, they, they find him guilty. 
uh, of blasphemy, of claiming to be God. And this is why uh, he was uh, executed. This is why he was crucified, because, because the Jews convicted him of blasphemy. Um, all right, Brother Joe. Yeah, it, it'd be uh, the Pharisees of the day and, and some of the more uh, studious uh, uh, civilian population, if you want to put it that way, of, of uh, Israel, were well aware of the coming Messiah. And, and uh, it, it came to me as we were talking about Christ forgiving sins prior to the cross, while Abraham and, and uh, his, his, uh, uh, and his uh, lineage uh, were forgiven by their faith, and they were, uh, they were justified by their faith, and their sins were forgiven by faith that the coming Messiah would pay the price. So, so the Pharisees and the Sadducees especially were, were well aware that there was a coming Messiah. That's what all these people had faith in. And uh, I think, again, I wish I had better scripture reference knowledge. My memory is gone. Bill, where are you? Uh, you know, people would say, he's the Messiah. He's the Messiah. He, it, John the Baptist said, here comes the Messiah. So it, they can't claim ignorance. You know, they, they knew that the Messiah was coming. They knew the signs that would uh, follow him. And, uh, and, you know, just like they stoned the prophets, uh, they rejected him as the Messiah. And uh, so, yeah, they, they knew to look for him. And uh, they rejected him all the same, even with the fulfillment of all the prophecies. Well, uh, I made this point uh, in my, my study of the book of John. I, I posed a couple of questions that I was hoping someone could uh, uh, make a comment or a response video and, and give me an answer. Uh, but I've always wondered why in uh, Luke 9, 20, 21, and I think it's also in... Uh, uh, it, it's one of the other gospel accounts. I can't recall which one. This is um, when when Jesus sent his uh, disciples off uh, to do some ministry. And when they came back, he asked them, what are the people saying about it, about me? And they said, well, they, they say you're the prophet or you're the promised one or you're John the Baptist. And, and then, then he says, but, but, who do you say that I am? And this is when, when Peter, he was the one that was always anxious to take the initiative. And he spoke up and said, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, of course, said that uh, he affirmed it by saying that you, you didn't get this from man. You got this from uh, a revelation from, from God. So he, he confirmed it. And it was, um, it was made into a very big deal, this, this uh, particular conversation. And yet, uh, as you were alluding to, Brother Joe, uh, many times he's identified as uh, uh, the Messiah, the Son of God, the Christ, the Lamb of God. All these are titles and descriptions of him, starting with John the Baptist, very in the very beginning of the book of John. John the Baptist identifies him as the Lamb of God and the Son of God. Then you have right after that, I believe it's Philip, that just says the same thing. Uh, and, and, and then you also have uh, Peter uh, even say it even before. And then you have an, an occasion where they're in a boat and, and uh, Jesus is uh, walking on the water and they, they identify him as the son of God. Numerous times uh, by numerous people, he is identified and named as the son of God. Jesus never disputes it. He accepts that as, his, as a uh, title as his identity, and, and, and yet when Peter says it at that particular time, um, it's like um, it, it's people think of that as the time when he this is declared, but it's not the first time, it's not, not the original time. So I've often wondered why that particular uh, conversation is, um, has so much distinction when, when numerous times before that, in, the, in this three and a half year ministry, numerous times he's already identified as the Son of God. Do you, do you have any thoughts on that, 
Brother Joe? Well, my brain's in overdrive now that now that you say what you said. You're right. Uh, it, it strikes me that that is that's absolutely true, and I hadn't considered it. Uh, yeah, somehow there must have been a a, a difference or a, a special revelation that that Peter had. You know, I I wonder if the 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 the, the scriptures were real clear that the Messiah would be divine. Uh, they knew that a savior was coming who would be the king of Israel, and they felt like this king would, uh, uh, you know, have his kingdom here on earth. So maybe there was some distinction. Maybe maybe they didn't see the Messiah necessarily as divine or God in flesh. Maybe they thought he was a special person like another David or something. I, I'm not really sure. But yeah, you make a real valid point. Uh, and when, when Peter said, uh, you were the son of God, that changes it from Messiah to uh, divinity. Maybe that's it. Uh, I know that there are many examples I could give you if I, if I had notes in front of me, but one that comes to my mind is the prophecy that says that uh, uh, he will be called Emmanuel, which translates God with us. Uh, so uh, they did look forward to this uh, coming savior uh, and a lot of a lot of different titles and, and, and uh, adjectives are, are said about him uh, hundreds of years even far back as, as uh, uh, David was a thousand years before Christ Isaiah was 53 I mean I was uh, 700 years before Christ and um, going back way centuries before, they are describing this coming Savior as the Christ, the Messiah, the, the term Son of God, and, the, uh, the, the, and also God with us. These terms are used. So uh, I'm sure that the typical Jew and even maybe the, the scholarly Jews, uh, some of them maybe didn't, didn't really put it together and, and, and either either uh, understand it perfectly or accept it as, as, as we do now in hindsight. There's a saying that uh, the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed and it's the New Testament and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. So the idea is that we look back in hindsight and we can see all the Old Testament scriptures that they're, they're very clearly what they're referring to. But at the time it was, it was uh, taking place these events were kind of like shrouded and and, uh, and um, uh, they, they weren't as under, understood uh, as we looking back can understand them now yeah prophecy is uh, is is interesting you know it's, it says we see through a, a glass darkly and uh, we will see things clearly and i guess that was uh, even more so uh, from the old testament to the new testament and and uh you know they in the past, in Israel's past, they had a lot of great people, great prophets that performed miracles, and uh, uh, that were not divine, of course. And so maybe there was not a clear understanding. We we mentioned yesterday when Peter said what he said, uh, Christ immediately followed up by saying to him and those with him, uh, "Do not reveal this. My my time is not yet come." And so he didn't want them going out and telling everybody that, that he was God incarnate, God in the flesh, at that point, anyway. And so, uh, yeah, there, there was some, some veiling going on from time to time. And uh, I think uh, there needed to be, like there is today, revelation knowledge. Something a little bit more than book learning. Uh, something that God has drawn you and you respond to. Uh, what it, the Bible says that prophecy is not given to tell the future. Prophecy is given uh, so that when something happens, we'll see God had said it would happen, and we'd know it was him who said it. And so there is some 20-20 uh, uh, hindsight uh, in God's plan. Okay, let me read a further. Uh, at first, Jesus wouldn't answer, so the high priest put him under oath. Being under oath, Jesus had to answer, and I'm 
so glad he did. He responded to the question, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed one, by saying, quote, I am, unquote. An, anal an analysis of Christ's testimony shows that he claimed to be, one, the son of the blessed one, that's God, two, the one who would sit at the right hand of power, and three, the son of man who would come on the clouds of heaven. Each of the affirmations uh, is distinctively messianic. The cumulative effect of all three is significant. The Sanhedrin, the Jewish court, caught all three points, and the high priest responded by tearing his garments and saying, what further need do we have of witnesses? Uh, they, they had finally heard it from him themselves. He was convicted by the words of his own mouth. Now, also, I find it interesting, too, in the beginning, he, uh, when he was asked, he remained silent. And that, that is a fulfillment of the prophecy that we read in Isaiah, uh, I don't know, a couple of hangouts ago. I somehow, I don't remember the subject of the hangout, but we, we, we got involved in that, and, and I read the entire Isaiah 53, and that's one of the, one of the verses in there is that he, he did not open his mouth, he remained silent. So only when he was put under oath did he speak. He didn't made no attempt to defend himself. Uh, I, think it, I think it might even have it. That's true, and I think it may have another facet yet, uh, Luke. I think he was silent to the Gentile courts, and he revealed himself to the Jewish courts or the Israeli courts because he had come to uh, to the nation of Israel, not to the Gentiles, and so. Uh, I think he was silent before Pilate and, and uh, secular courts and, and then revealed himself before the, the, the Sanhedrin. Okay, that's an interesting distinction. Uh, now, continue reading. It says, uh, Robert Anderson points out, quote, no confirmatory evidence is more convincing than that of hostile witnesses. And the fact that the Lord laid claim to deity is incontestably established by the actions of his enemies. We must remember that the Jews were not a tribe of ignorant savages, but a highly cultured and intensely religious people. And it was upon this very charge that without a dissenting voice, his death was decreed by the Sanhedrin their great national council, composed of the most eminent of their religious leaders, including men of the type of Gamaliel and his great pupil, Saul of Tarsus. It is clear then that this is the testimony Jesus wanted to bear about himself. We also see that the Jews understood his reply as a claim to be to his being God. There were two alternatives to be faced then that his assertions were blasphemy or that he was God. His judges saw the issue clearly, so clearly, in fact, that they crucified him and then taunted him because, quote, he trusted in God for he said, I am the son of God, unquote. That's Matthew 27, 43. Uh, you know, the... The interesting thing about the study so far uh, is this, we, the first session, uh, we, we discussed quite a few verses where the scriptures say, and, and the apostles, they're saying that uh, things about Jesus, uh, that he is God. And then, of course, so some people say, well, it doesn't say, the Bible doesn't say Jesus is God, and we certainly disproved that in session number one. And then in session number two, we... Uh, we got into these verses of this uh, argument. Well, Jesus himself never claimed to be God, and now we've debunked that. He's clearly made the claim, and uh, this trial of his is a perfect example of his claim. And that's why they understood it was a claim to be God, and that's why he was found guilty of blasphemy. Uh, Brother Joe, before I read on, anything else? Yeah, I, it, it strikes me that uh, then, as now, uh, even with evidence, you have to have 
uh, a desire for truth. I, I mean, your people are blinded, not by God, but by their own flesh and their own darkness. Uh, they, I think people prefer darkness when it means that uh, uh, they would lose whatever it is that they, they think that is important to them, whether it's power or nowadays uh, lifestyle or, or pride, who knows. But uh, yeah, revelatory knowledge is, is uh, certainly a part of coming to faith in Christ. All right, I'll continue reading. H.B. Uh, Sweet explains the significance. By the way, he's mentioning a lot of people and quoting them. I, I, many of these people, I don't know who they are. I'm just assuming that they're theologians or historians or something that are of, of, of some uh, repute. H.B. Sweet explains the significance of the high priest tearing his garment quote the law forbade the high priest to rend his garment in private troubles that's in leviticus 10 6 and leviticus 21 10. but when acting as a judge he was required by custom to express in this way his horror of any blasphemy uttered in his presence the relief of the embarrassed judge is uh, manifest. If trustworthy evidence was not forthcoming, the necessity for it had now been superseded. The prisoner had incriminated himself. Yeah, we know that they had brought a lot of witnesses against him that were just making up lies, these false witnesses. Uh, and, and then, of course, he's called on to testify himself, and then he doesn't speak, but when he's put under oath, he speaks yeah, and, and his own words convict him brother <clears throat> yeah I'm, I, I'm uh, aware of the, the custom it's still here today among the Orthodox Jew and and I, I say this not from personal knowledge but just from seeing it on TV shows I think that I, I know that uh, it's still a custom when when someone uh, wants to be rid of you and not have them in their lives anymore uh, they rip their shirt and so I've seen that. Uh, so it still must be uh, the custom of the day uh, for the Orthodox. It's funny how the customs of 2,000 and 3,000 years are alive and well when it comes to those of the Jewish lineage. Another prophecy fulfilled, by the way, right there. <laughs> well, uh, I've never witnessed the Jew any Jews tearing their clothing in that, that way. But of course, I'm not nearly as offensive as you, you know, so I just, you know, you've probably gone around offending Jews a lot. So you've seen them tearing their clothes because they, well, I try, I try to offend as many pretty blondes as possible, but so far none of them are ripping their shirts off. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, we, uh, I'm reading, continuing to read now. It says, uh, we begin to see that this was no ordinary trial. As uh, lawyer Erwin Linton brings out, quote, unique among criminal trials is this one in which not the actions, but the identity of the accused is the issue. The criminal charge laid against Christ, the confession or testimony, or rather, act in presence of the court on which he was convicted, the interrogation by the Roman governor and the inscription and proclamation on his cross at the time of execution, all are concerned with the one question of Christ's real identity and dignity. Quote, what think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? Unquote. Wow, that's a really profound concept, isn't it, brother? Yeah, it is, uh, and, it, and it, uh, it it brings to mind that the Roman court, uh, the secular court, could find no crime. They could find no sin. They could find no uh, anything against him that would justify uh, his death. And so the only thing left was to uh, say that he was a threat to Caesar, 
because he was claiming to be a king that was not authorized. And so while they could find no sin or, or crime, uh, the only thing they could lay their hat on, or Pilate, the only thing Pilate could lay hand on to justify this, the Roman government taking his life uh, were not the, the offenses against the Jewish law, but the threat he posed to Caesar as an unsanctioned king of Israel. Yeah, I mean, normally people are tried for something that they've done. Did did you do this or did you not do it? Uh, it's an act that you're either guilty or innocent of. And in, in this case, it's it's the question of who are you? <laughs> right, <laughs> or who he was. Yeah. Or who he claimed to be. Yes. Uh, all right, so I'll continue reading. Judge Gaynor the accomplished jurist of the New York bench in his address on the trial of Jesus takes the position that blasphemy was the one charge made against him before the Sanhedrin. He says, quote, it is plain from each of the gospel narratives that the alleged crime for which Jesus was tried and convicted was blasphemy. Jesus had been claiming supernatural power which in a human being was blasphemy, unquote. Um, let me see, it says, uh, in citing in John 10, 33, Gainer's reference is to Jesus's making himself God, not to what he did about the temple. Um, in most trials, people are tried for what they have done but this was not true of Christ. Uh, Jesus was tried for who he was. The trial of Jesus ought to be sufficient to demonstrate convincingly that he confessed his divinity. His, his judges witnessed to that, but also on the day of his crucifixion, his enemies acknowledged that he claimed to be God come in the flesh. Quote, in the same way the chief priests along with the uh, the scribes and elders were mocking him and saying, he saved others, he cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Uh, let him now come down from the cross and we shall believe in him. He trusts in God, let him deliver him now if he takes pleasure in him. For he said, I am the son of God. Matthew 27 verses 41 to 43. And that, that completes chapter one of this book. Um, all right, brother, that's uh, the same same point again, that it, uh, uh, he was tried and convicted for uh, his, his claim of yeah, it, it doesn't escape me that uh, uh, the prophecies of the Old Testament, it must have, you know, thinking Pharisees must have been troubled after, during or after the execution, because the prophecies were written some 1,600 years prior to Christ that he would be crucified on a stake or on, wo on a wooden cross or however you want to translate it. And that type of uh, execution was not invented or even thought of back when it was written. <clears throat> and had the Pharisees given it 30 seconds thought, they'd be going, oh boy, oh, did we, did we just uh, help fulfill a prophecy here? And, and it also doesn't escape me that when uh, Christ forgave those who were mocking him, another prophecy fulfilled, he forgave the Gentiles. Uh, he, for, he, for, he didn't forgive the Pharisees. He didn't forgive the religious leaders. But he forgive, forgave those who were taking his life, uh, the Romans and, and those who uh, were in attendance. So uh, I, I think there's something to that. I don't know what it is, but I think it's, there's a little, little gold to be mined there by, if you ever stop and, and study that, just that portion. Yeah, I'm trying to recall the, the verse that talks about, uh, I think he's talking to Pontius Pilate, saying that uh, you're not guilty, it's the people who brought me to you that, they're, that are guilty. Yeah. yeah remember, I, remember how that's expressed? I do. Uh, it, Ten years ago, I'd remember it right off the bat. Uh, not so much now, uh, but yeah, I do know the verse you're referring to. The verse is. Mm -hmm. All right.
Okay, we're ready to begin with chapter two now. And the title of this chapter is something that we've already talked about uh, quite a bit, but this chapter is going to go into much greater detail. And this is this uh, concept that uh, I think that it was originally came from C.S. Lewis, and it's Lord Liar or Lunatic. <clears throat> the distinct claims of Jesus, wait, before I say this, though, before we start this, I, I wanted to say that uh, I've always been amazed, you know, considering the fact that I've read the Bible so many times, studied it extensively. Uh, I, I don't, I've never been able to understand how anybody can make a claim if they had any kind of knowledge about the Bible. How could they make a claim that the Bible doesn't, doesn't uh, say that Jesus is God, and even more so, they claim Jesus himself never claimed to be God. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's so absurd because we've already pointed out in the, in the first two sessions and, and now today how clearly it's stated over and over again, and even Jesus himself declares it. And, and, and yet people continually repeat this. It's like a it's like a fable that people make up or something all of a sudden it's repeated over and over it's like maybe it's like that that uh mandela effect thing with the lion and the lamb uh the you know the bible doesn't say a lion lays down with the lamb it says the wolf lays down with the lamb but somehow people mixed up that that whole verse talks about a lion laying down with the cattle and, and then there's a wolf laying down with a dwelling with the lamb and they kind of jumble it together and then uh, people start repeating it incorrectly. And it gets said so much that people start just automatically believing that's well, you, the way it is. You know, Luke, that, that was, uh, that was uh, the lion and the lamb. It, it's revelations uh, where it says Christ came as a lamb and will return as a lion. He came as a sacrifice but will return as a king. And so uh, they made so many songs and poems and and. and artwork with him Christ being a lion and Christ being a lamb and so that's what people are familiar with so then all of a sudden after seeing so much voluminous information on lion Christ being the lamb and Christ being the lion that spoke of in revelations that when they hear the verse in Isaiah they go well, that's not right well it's not right if you don't study your Bible sure you know it's, it's what you're familiar with hearing in pop culture yeah, I, I'm just thinking that this is maybe <clears throat> that's the only way of explaining this uh, problem that persists. And that is the fact that so many times I hear people, I, 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 they, obviously these people are not, they don't study the Bible as we have or they know better. But it's just very common for people to say, well, the Bible doesn't say Jesus is God. Or Jesus never claimed to be God, you know. And yet it's it's blatantly false that 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 those statements he, it's clear the Bible says a hundred different ways he's God, and he himself declares it, and, and that's why he was convicted for blasphemy. So anybody who says that, it's absolute ignorance, but they probably heard someone else say it, and therefore they're just repeating it. Well, Luke, it's, it's like the doctrine of uh, eternal hellfire. Uh, people, and, and I'm not saying that's wrong, okay? It's, it's a valid opinion, and it's, and it's certainly understandable how someone can see that in scripture but uh, as far as studying the bible people wait for a good sunday morning sermon they get snippets on radio shows uh you know i would say 90 percent of the church uh, rarely picks up the bible to study it and when they do it's usually to uh, uh to the teaching of another and so waiting for a Sunday sermon and, and uh, gleaning whatever it is you come away with is, is how Americans or how modern man studies scripture. Yeah, I've, uh, I, I, this may sound horrible what I'm going to say next. I don't even know if I should say this. You know that the, in Romanism, they didn't want the, the, the lay person to have the scriptures and I think they didn't want them to have it because uh, they would learn the truth that the, the teachings of uh, Roman Catholicism are not biblical. Um, but one of their, their arguments is that the lay person can't really understand it. Leave it to the clergy. They can understand it, and then they'll speed, spoon feed it to you. And that's the same kind of concept with Jehovah Witnesses. They think that, 
Well, you can't, they can't really understand it. They need the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society Committee of Scholars to write their newsletter and teach you what it, what it really means. And so, but uh, you and I, we've, we've studied it, Ted studied it, and many people we know, we've studied the Bible for many, many years. And uh, um, some things may be hard to understand, but the more you delve into it and really study it, you, you can understand it. Uh, well, for, for the most part, but uh, let, me, let me finish this conclusion before, because I might blow your socks off when I make <laughs> this conclusion here. Okay, uh, I've, I've always felt that, you know, reading the Bible is, is a very important thing to do for a Christian, and I've done it. Uh, and yet, I, a lot of the people I know who do take Bible study seriously, you know, not your typical Christian, the ones that you cited earlier. They go to church, they listen to the pastor, but they never crack open a Bible or, or rarely do on their own. Well, that person is probably better off than most of the people I know who really study the Bible. Because the people who start really studying the Bible, it's sad. But many of these people become zealous dogmatists about minor doctrines and that they end up becoming like fanatics that are that you can't I don't want to have anything to do with because they, they and and they, I wish I wish they had never studied the Bible those people now Luke, what do you think of that Luke I, 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 I should tell you you should have muted yourself a few minutes ago but it's too late now uh, <laughs> no no you know what uh, I, I hadn't thought about it but you're kind of right I was thinking of the term fast food theology when, when we were talking about uh, uh, the people who don't crack open their Bible but wait for an expedient sermon for understanding. And you know what, what comes to mind after you said what you said? The, these dogmatists are kind of like vegetarians. You know, they, they get into their, their special diet and, uh, and all they'll talk about is, is their kale. And, and, and uh, they're just annoying. And, and they only see things one way. And, and they could use a little teaching and, and use a little humility. Uh, but I have a feeling that uh, even those guys, the, the dogmatists, generally are put on their rails by a teacher, whether it's John MacArthur or uh, Piper or one of these guys. They send them in a direction, and all of a sudden they've got filtered glasses. And so everything they see, they mentally line up with what they've heard and, uh, and it, you know how it is, Luke, <clears throat> you can look in a, in a, at a bunch of clouds and people see faces, they see dogs, they see whatever's, you know, in their mind. And so it's not so different with Calvinism and, and uh, Roman Catholicism. They've got a bent, they've been put on a, a, a certain path, and they have a tendency to see what they've been told to see. Okay. I wonder what kind of reaction I'll get from that that statement that uh, many of the people that I know that really studied the Bible, uh, I wish they hadn't because they become crazy fanatics uh, that uh, are um, that the the average person that just goes to church and just learns the basic gospel and doesn't get into great depth of study as, as we have, they're probably better off than the people that get obsessed studying the Bible. And, you know, we are, we're obsessed with studying it, but, but we haven't become dogmatists in that we're elevating every little minor doctrine that becomes our pet doctrine to such importance, like this thing that's happening with the Mandela effect with some people now. They're elevating this, this sci-fi type of a thing and introducing it into theology, and then they're not only obsessed with it, but they're saying, if you don't agree, then you're you're obviously a lost person. So, if if a person wanted to believe in that uh, the Mandela effect and and say that you know there's a, uh, some things have been altered in, in a new reality and, and uh, it, you know I would say okay I think you're a little off. you I don't think I'm, I'm I question your intelligence and your reasoning power. But it wouldn't it wouldn't rise to the level I say well you you're a, I don't want to have anything to do with you. You're a heretic. But when they start making it a test and saying, you have to agree with this or else you're obviously don't have the Holy Spirit. This is another example of, of taking something that, OK, it's kind of silly, but it would be harmless if you just if you kept it apart from the Bible. 
Yeah, I, I've, said this, I've said the same thing to these guys. You know, if you want to make a big deal about Jeff Peanut Butter or the Bernstein Bears, I'm fine with that. Uh, I might even give it a second thought uh, until it crosses the line into God's preserved and holy word. But, you know, <clears throat> as you spoke, I saw a thread that runs through all of these sects, whether it's Calvinism, Roman Catholicism, Mandela effect, any of the cults. Is it, have you noticed there's always pride? There's always an element of pride involved. And, and uh, especially with Calvinists and, and uh, these Mandela guys, they, they seem to have uh, a real issue with being right and being proud of being right. I just, I just sense a lot of pride from these people. Um, yeah, uh, pride might be the right word. I, I, I think of it more as egomania. <laughs> All right, so chapter two, the title is Lord Liar or Lunatic? Question mark. The distinct claims of Jesus to be God eliminate the popular ploy of skeptics who regard Jesus as just a good moral man or a prophet who said a lot of profound things. So often that conclusion is passed off as the only one acceptable to scholars or as the obvious result of the intellectual process. The trouble is many people nod their heads in agreement and never see the fallacy of such reasoning. To Jesus, who men and women believed him to be, was of fundamental importance. To say what Jesus said and to claim what he claimed about himself, one couldn't conclude he was just a good moral man or prophet. That alternative isn't open to an individual, and Jesus never intended it to be. C.S. Lewis, who was a professor at Cambridge University and once an agnostic, understood this issue clearly. He writes, quote, I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him, about Jesus. And that is, I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God, unquote. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on a level of with a man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make uh, your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. Brother, that's a very profound point. Yeah, it is. Uh, yeah, I was just letting that sink in. Uh, yeah, absolutely a profound point, and and one that we don't use enough, I think, when we talk to uh, agnostics. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I'm going to put that in my my uh, uh, my arrows there. That that point, but you know, it, it brings up what I, I mentioned this yesterday, but it, it, it's just exactly related to what you were just saying. The rich young ruler, he came to Christ and he said, uh, good master, good rabbi, what must I do to be saved? And Christ said, why do you call me good? Only God is good. And people have always wondered a lot. There's a lot of, why didn't he tell him he was God? Well, because the rich young ruler did not recognize him as the son of God and was trying to work his way to heaven. And Christ was showing him through experience, uh, okay, well, if you want to work your way to heaven, here's what you got to do. And, uh, and of course, it was impossible. But uh, why do you call me good? Only God is good. Uh, Christ revealing that someone who didn't believe in him should have. Yeah, I mean, he was giving the young man the opportunity of saying, well, I'm, I'm calling you good. Only God is good. I call you good because you are God. You are the Son of God. But the young man didn't didn't say that. He just first. If you notice that particular uh, point of the conversation, it kind of went over the young man's head, and he he didn't even respond to Jesus' comeback on that. He he went on and asked, uh, you know, what do I have to do? Well, he's a pre he's a pre cross Calvinist. 
<laughs> you know, the same thing could be said to them today. <laughs> All right. Now I'll continue reading here. It says, uh, then Lewis adds, quote, you can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God but let us not come up with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He was not, he has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, it, call him an enlightened master and then deny everything he said about himself doesn't make much sense you're muted Luke. yeah if in other words uh, if a person understands that Jesus did claim to be God uh, then then uh, it, you cannot possibly say a person who's claiming to be God um, and is not really God that you can't conclude that they're a great moral teacher or uh, you know a uh, you know, uh, for whatever the other descriptions are, but a uh, highly involved, enlightened uh, master, you know, uh, what, whatever people want to say about him, uh, as, as, as C.S. Lewis says here, he didn't leave that option. That option is not open to you because uh, unless you're not aware that he actually claimed to be God. But if a person acknowledges, yes, Jesus did claim to be God, and he wasn't, but he was a good moral teacher, well, how does that those things can't can't be fit together well can you think can you think of a religion or a sect luke that uh say god would or say that jesus was was a lunatic no can you think of a religion or a sect and i include islam in this who didn't say he was a great man they all say it he's a great man he's an enlightened teacher he's a he's a top shelf kind of guy and yet uh they deny what he clearly proclaimed and in the same breath. It, it's like somebody who's never studied the Bible and, but doesn't want to uh, uh, come out on the wrong side of uh, history, I suppose. I, I don't understand it. I don't see I can be blinded to him claiming to be God. But even uh, yesterday, Luke, I was going through the videos of someone that I'm very fond of who calls himself a Christian, who uh, has come to the conclusion that uh, Christ was a man from God and elevated in some way, but uh, not God, you know, not God incarnate. And so it just disturbs me to see how easily uh, people can miss the obvious. Yeah, but the, the thing is, um, I, this this last year, I've, I've done a lot of studies, uh, and I have a lot of videos and playlists on early church history, early church heresies, early church creeds and it's been it was very fascinating to study all all that and i'll tell you that this viewpoint that that friend of yours expressed i mean these things are not new these are so ancient they go back to the, the you know the the, the beginnings of the, the second century where people i think it was marcion that, that presented that idea that uh he was not oh phone here that uh, Marcion, I think, was the one that said that he he was uh, uh, not he was not uh, God. He was uh, was a man, and uh, so whether you think that he was, uh, uh, and then then other people say, well, he he is God in a certain respect, but he was he did have a beginning. He's the first thing that God created. Well, that that's that's the viewpoint of a Jehovah's Witness. Okay, you back. Okay, um, so, but the point here I'm making here is all these different viewpoints about who Jesus is, all the possible viewpoints and explanations of who he is, uh, the, there's nothing new. And, you know, they're early in the uh, first few centuries of the church, uh, these things were all argued and debated, and, and uh, I'm, I am thankful for these um, theologians from the second and third century that did have the councils and the debates and and uh, bec because of what the scripture said they concluded that he is god 
he's the son of God, the God's the father and God's this Holy Spirit and there's a tri triunity of God. All this stuff is clearly spelled out in these Christian creeds. Well, you, like mentioned, you mentioned Marcy, right? <clears throat> wasn't he, <clears throat> wasn't he a Gnostic? <clears throat> Excuse me. Let, let me the, Gnostics, the Gnostics are just like uh, uh, the people of today. What they do, as soon as you take the Bible and say it's not literal, as soon as you cast doubt on the literal interpretation of Scripture, then you have the freedom to deny what's clearly obvious in, in Christ's claims for divinity. Uh, well, you... Let me see if my... Yeah, okay, my speaker's on. Um, I'm just looking at my notes here on this, and you, you've got Marcionism, Docetism, and Gnosticism, and and uh, Adoptionism, and uh, Manichaeanism. All these isms here are are all uh, revolve around understand or understanding and a belief of how do you describe Jesus, and. and and I can't tell you off the top of my head unless I go back and review it all again exactly what each one of them means. Uh, well, it's irrelevant to this point because all of them have one thing in common. They deny the literal interpretation of Scripture. And, uh, you know, there there is allegory within Scripture. That's clear from the parables. But uh, when you, once you say Scripture cannot be taken literally, uh, you have opened the floodgates for misunderstanding. Right. Okay, let me continue reading here. So, uh, by the way, uh, since since we're not going to get sidetracked, and and, I, and, I, and I'm also I'm also not going to attempt to just extemporaneously uh, define all those terms I just rattled off. Uh, if you are interested in all that, go to my playlist. Uh, uh, early church history, early church heresies, early church creeds, three different playlists, and go through that. And, and I think if you have an interest in this, you'll you'll be very, uh, it is very fascinating to, to study the, the first few centuries of the church, uh, all the things that, all the debates that took place and all the conclusions. You know, I, went, I, went to the, I went to that playlist about five years ago, Luke, and I said, you know, I'm a, I think I'll listen. This is something I'm interested in. That's five years ago. I still haven't listened. Maybe, maybe I'll go back now. Yeah. Well, uh, the, the, I'll tell you that the, to me, the, 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 the good thing that they did, um, the so-called church fathers, is they really codified uh, the, the Godhead and defined the, the, the persons and, and they did a great job. Uh, but what they failed was to address uh, uh, how do you get saved. It was blurry, but in their extra biblical teachings of that time, uh, it, they got off track immediately from faith alone, and they, they started um, incorporating things like water baptism and, and communion sacraments. And all these things uh, were became part of a formula for salvation. So it's faith plus works, and that that began to happen right in this in the second century. And that's that's the sad, unfortunate thing that happened. But at least they did a good job of uh, uh, really clarifying the Godhead. Uh, all right, so continue reading. It says, uh, F.J.A. Hort. Now, that's interesting. He has three initials. F.J.A. Hort, who spent uh, 28 years in a critical study of the New Testament text, writes, quote, his words were so completely parts and utterances of himself that he had no meaning as abstract statements of truth uttered by him as a divine oracle or prophet. Take away himself as the primary, though not the ultimate objective uh, subject of every statement, and they all fall to pieces, unquote. I'm not sure I even followed that, that statement there. Did, did that make any sense to you? It, it, what came to mind is uh, Doyle's uh, Sherlock Holmes uh, when he when he said to Watson, uh, "You have an amazing grasp for the obvious. Uh, so many people don't." All right, and then I'll continue reading. It says, 
In the words of Candace Scott LaTourette, historian of Christianity at Yale University, quote, it is not his teachings which make Jesus so remarkable, although these would be enough to give him distinction. It is a combination of the teachings with the man himself. The two cannot be separated, unquote. Um, it must be obvious, LaTourette concludes, to any thoughtful reader of the gospel records that Jesus regarded himself and his message as inseparable. He was a great teacher, but he was more. His teachings about the kingdom of God, about human conduct, and about God were important, but they could not be divorced from him without, uh, from this, from his standpoint, being vitiated. Um, Jesus' claim to be God, Jesus claimed to be God. He didn't leave any other option open. His claim must either be either true or false. So it is something that should be given serious consideration. Jesus' question to his disciples, but who do you say that I am? Matthew 16, 15 has several alternatives. First, consider that his claim to be God was false. If it was false, then we have two and only two alternatives. He either knew it was false or he didn't know it was false. We will consider each one separately and examine the evidence. Wow, that's interesting. So if, if he knew, if his claim was not true, did he actually believe it was true and it wasn't? Or did he know it was not true and just claimed to be it? What the, the ramifications of those two things are fascinating too. Yeah, I, I just went over to uh, my Yahoo tab and looked up the word vitiated. <laughs> it was it was unfamiliar to me, but uh, uh, it's practicing error. You know, here's here's how I get what you just said. Uh, when someone raises a dead body back to life, enough said. You know what I mean? It, it, you you're you're not only saying you're God, you're doing the works of God. And, and uh, your words and your actions flow together nicely. And you got to be kind of stupid to deny either side of that equation. Two plus two equals four. Okay, so the, the first possibility in, in this uh, scenario is uh, he's, he's not really God and he knew it, but he claimed to be God. So that question is, was he a liar? Um, if, when Jesus made his claims, he knew that he was not God, then he was lying and deliberately deceiving his followers. But if he was a liar, then he was also a hypocrite because he told others to be honest, whatever the cost, while he himself taught and lived a colossal lie. More than that, he was a demon because he told others to trust him for their eternal destiny. If he couldn't back up his claims and knew it, then he was unspeakably evil. Last, he would also be a fool because it was his claims to being God that led to his crucifixion. Yeah. I mean, look where, you know, if you, if you follow this to its logical conclusions you know, that, uh, well, he's not really God, and even, but he, he did claim to be God. You can't just think that, well, he's a great moral teacher, great religious leader. You have to dismiss all that and, and look at other other ways to describe him, right? Yeah, it, it, it really fits uh, how the Pharisees reacted to Christ because if you're raising people from the dead and healing thousands of people uh, verifiably everywhere you go, uh, that's a supernatural power. And the Pharisees were not so uh, ill-informed as to think that a man has that power. And so therefore you're left, if you're a Pharisee, with two options. That power is from God or that power is from Satan. Guess what? They chose wrong. Well, 
that's to me that's why we, we talk about this all the time it is it, it's, it's one of the most integral parts of a gospel message is this bodily resurrection uh he he, he said he would prove his claims were true by raising himself from the dead and uh, that's 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 why the uh, I'm, I'm probably jumping ahead i know this is discussed later in the book too but uh that that, that that's what that's the event that changed these apostles from cowards hiding out in fear for their lives to, 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 to bold witnesses testifying about Jesus' resurrection at the cost of their lives. So uh, that resurrection is, that, that's, what, that's the significance and importance of it. Yeah, when, when you're uh, healing people and you're raising other people from the dead, your, uh, your uh, actions, I guess, in the Pharisees' mind could be attributed to Satan. Uh, that supernatural side of uh, things. But when he raises himself from the dead, you got to deny it. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's That just can't be tolerated. Uh, we're just going to ignore that happening. Okay. Uh, uh, let's see, where was I? Um. Uh, Many will say that Jesus was a good moral teacher. Let's be realistic. How could he be a great moral teacher and knowingly mislead people at the most important point of his teachings, his own identity? So that, that rules out the fact, if, if people say, well, you know, he was a good moral teacher, but he's, he's not God and Savior. It rules that out. Uh, you would have to conclude logically that he was a deliberate liar. This view of Jesus, however, doesn't coincide with what we know either of him or the results of his life and teachings. Wherever Jesus has been proclaimed, lives have been changed for the good. Nations have changed for the better. Thieves are made honest. Alcoholics are cured. Hateful individuals become channels of love. Unjust persons have become just. William Leckie, one of the Great Britain's most noted historians and a dedicated opponent of organized Christianity, writes, quote, it was reserved for Christianity to present to the world an ideal character, which through all the changes of eight, uh, 18 centuries has inspired the hearts of men with an impassioned love has shown itself capable of acting on all ages, nations, temperaments, and conditions, has been not only the highest pattern of virtue, but the strongest incentive to its practice. The simple record of these three short years of active life has done more to regenerate and soften mankind than all the disquisitions of philosophers and all the exhortations of moralists. And this is a uh, dedicated opponent of organized Christianity. Yeah, any, anywhere where the teachings of Christ are embraced, society uh, uh, definitely improves and, and uh, becomes powerful in a righteous way. Uh, there's a course uh, that Hillsdale College gives away for free. If anyone's interested, go to hillsdalecollege.org. But uh, it, it talks about the influence of Christ's teachings on nations, and specifically America, you know, uh, slavery, the, the abolitionist movement, uh, uh, abortion, civil rights. You can find it all through the church, the, the, the true church of Christ uh, always moves us in a, in a good direction. All right. Um, historian Philip Schaff says, quote, this testimony, if not true, must be downright blasphemy or madness. The former hypothesis cannot stand a moment before the moral purity and dignity of Jesus revealed in his every word and work and acknowledged by universal consent. Self-deception in a matter so momentous and with an intellect in all respects so clear and so sound 
is equally out of the question. How could he be an enthusiast or a madman who never lost the e even balance of his mind, who sailed serenely over all the troubles and persecutions as the sun above the clouds, who always returned the wisest answer to tempting questions, who calmly and deliberately predicted his death on the cross, his resurrection on the third day, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the founding of his church, the destruction of Jerusalem, predictions which have been literally fulfilled, a character so original, so complete, so uniformly consistent, so perfect, so human and yet so high above all human greatness can be neither a fraud nor a fiction. The poet, as has been well said, would in this case be greater than the hero. It would take more than a Jesus to invent a Jesus, unquote. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, Luke, uh, I can't think of any religion or sect of people or even uh, uh, agnostics that attribute or, or uh, bad judgment or uh, uh, anything negative to Christ. They don't do it because it's not there. You'd have to make something up out of whole cloth. The very first time that I heard anybody, uh, any religious figure attribute a sin to Christ was the Pope. And that was just recently when he said Christ sinned against his parents when uh, he went to teach in, in the temple at age 12. But other than the Pope, I can't think of anybody that attributed to any sin or, or uh, uh, poor character traits to the person of Christ, whether they uh, consider him divine or not. Yeah, that, that's why this, this whole idea that uh, um, Jesus claimed to be God, and he wasn't, but he's still a good moral teacher, this is oxymoronic. These, 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 these are actually mutually exclusive ideas. Uh, okay, elsewhere, Schaff gives convincing uh, argument against Christ being a liar. Quote, how in the name of logic, common sense, and experience could an imposter that is a deceitful, selfish, depraved man have invented and consistently maintained from the beginning to end the purest and noblest character known in history with the most perfect air of truth and reality. How could he have conceived and successfully carried out a plan of unparalleled beneficence, moral magnitude and sublimity and sacrifice his own life for it in the face of the strongest prejudices of his people and age. Yeah, it, it just, it, it, uh, it goes against common sense. I mean, you really have to uh, develop a, uh, a system of, of disbelief or a system of, of alternate explanation to, uh, to not attribute divinity to Christ <clears throat> based on what he said and did. Okay, um, if Jesus wanted to get people to follow him and believe in him as God, why did he go to the Jewish nation? Why go to a Nazarene carpenter uh, uh, as a country? Why go as a Nazarene carpenter to a country so small in size and population and so thoroughly adhering to the undivided unity of God? Why didn't he go to Egypt or even more to Greece where they believed in various gods and various manifestations of them? Someone who lived as Jesus lived, taught as Jesus taught, and died as Jesus died could not have been a liar. What other alternatives are there? Well, the, so the question is, uh, if Jesus was not God, and he knew he was not God, he was lying. 
So that's been uh, addressed here. Now, what if he was not God, claimed to be God, but really thought he was God? That's the next question is, was he a lunatic? Uh, if it is inconceivable for Jesus to be a liar, then couldn't he actually have thought to be God, but, but been mistaken? After all, it's possible to be both sincere and wrong, but we must remember that for someone to think himself God, especially in a fiercely monotheistic culture, and then to tell others that their eternal destiny depended on believing in him is no slight flight of fancy, of, of fantasy, but the thoughts of a lunatic in the fullest sense. Was Jesus Christ such a person? Someone who believes he is God sounds like someone today believing himself Napoleon. Uh, he would be deluded and self-deceived and probably he would be locked up so he wouldn't hurt himself or anyone else. Yet, in Jesus, we don't observe the abnormalities and imbalance that usually go along with being deranged. His poise and composure would certainly be amazing if he were insane. Well, it, not only that, I'd go further. Uh, a deranged person usually doesn't have the ability to raise people from the dead and restore lost limbs and sight and uh, and hearing and uh, every other kind of ailment. Yes, amen. Uh, noise and cold in a medical text describe the schizophrenic as a person who is more autistic than realistic. The schizophrenic desires to escape from the world of reality. Let's face it, claiming to be God would certainly be a retreat from reality. In light of the other things we know about Jesus, it's hard to imagine that he was mentally disturbed. Here's a man who spoke some of the most profound sayings ever recorded. His instructions have liberated many individuals in mental bondage. Clark H. Pinnock asked, quote, was he deluded about his greatness, a paranoid, an unintentional deceiver, a schizophrenic? Again, the skill and depth of his teachings support the case only for his total mental soundness. If only we were as sane as he, unquote. A student at a California university told me that his psychology professor had said in class that, quote, all he has to do is pick up the Bible and read portions of Christ's teachings to many of his patients. That's all the counseling they need, unquote. Yeah, yeah, psychobabble definitely uh, falls short of, uh, of uh, uh, biblical teaching. I think it's pretty universal. You're muted. You're muted. Thank you. Thank you. Why, did, why didn't you mute me when I said that thing earlier that I didn't want to say? I'm not very quick on the trigger, otherwise I would. <laughs> Psychiatrist J.T. Fisher states, quote, If you were to take the sum total of all authoritative articles ever written by the most qualified of psychologists and psychiatrists, on the subject of mental hygiene, if you were to combine them and refine them and cleave out the excess verbiage, if you were to take the whole of the meat and none of the parsley, and you, and if you were to have these unadulterated bits of pure scientific knowledge concisely expressed by the most capable of living poets, you would have an awkward and incomplete summation of the Sermon on the Mount, and it would suffer immeasurably through comparison. For nearly 2,000 years, the Christian world has been holding it in its hands, the complete answer to its restless and fruitless yearnings. Here rests the blueprint for success, for a successful human life with optimism, mental health, and contentment. <laughs> 
unquote. Yeah, the, the Freud laid everything as an Oedipus complex. Uh, you've had all kinds of uh, pop psychology uh, go worldwide, but uh, they all pale in comparison to Christ pointing out sin being mankind's greatest issue. Mm -hmm. C.S. Lewis writes, quote, the historical difficulty of giving for the life sayings and influence of Jesus, any explanation that is not harder than the Christian explanations is very great. The discrepancy between the depth and sanity uh, of his moral teachings and the rampant megalomania which must lie behind his theological teachings unless he is indeed God has never been satisfactorily explained. Hence the non-Christian hypothesis uh, succeed one another with the restless fertility of bewilderment, unquote. That's C.S. Lewis. Uh, Philip Schaff reasons, quote, is such an intellect clear as the sky, embracing as the mountain air, sharp and penetrating as a sword, thoroughly healthy and vigorous, always ready and always self-possessed, liable to a radical and most serious delusion concerning his own character and mission, preposterous imagination. Yeah, so, well, the thing is, all, all of these um, beautiful uh, statements and declarations about Jesus' words in his life, uh, they're all true. I mean, I know they're all perfect descriptions because I've studied the Bible a, a lot, but you know, your, your, your average person who hasn't studied it, they, they, they probably don't even understand uh, that all of these uh, historians, theologians, psychologists and stuff, everything that I just read, they, if they haven't read the Bible and really studied Jesus' words in his life as we have, they wouldn't really even understand that these people are, are giving a perfect description of Jesus and his thoughts, his behavior, his conduct, his, everything about him. This is no exaggeration, what they've said about, about it. Yeah, I mean, you can, you can find libraries absolutely full of uh, book after book after book on how to... Uh, see life and live life and, and uh, deal with mental issues. Uh, but I mean, Christ said to honor and love God and respect your neighbor. And that, that one or two sentences uh, would bring more mental stability to society than the libraries full of psychological teachings. Uh, so that the, the, the question we're really asking uh, in, in this portion of the study is uh, Jesus claimed to be God. So we have to ask ourselves, do we believe his claim or not? And that's what Christianity really boils down to. Do you believe the claims of Jesus? He claimed to be God. He claimed to be the only savior, the only means of life everlasting. And uh, that uh, he claimed that he's the only way to go to heaven. Trust him, believe in him, he'll get you to heaven. It's guaranteed. Do you believe his claims and his promises? And that's that's what Christianity is really based upon. So uh, the question is, he claimed to be God. Is it true? Uh, if, if it was not true, then he's either lied about it or he's a lunatic. Of course, the other possibility and the, part, the, the, the conclusion that, that you and I have, and all of us who um, uh, believe in Jesus uh, as our great Savior God, we believe he is our Lord God, Savior. And that's the next final portion of this. It says, okay, if he's not a liar, not a lunatic, was he Lord? I cannot personally conclude that Jesus was a liar or a lunatic. The only other alternative is that he was the Christ, the Son of God, as he claimed. When I discuss this with most Jewish people, 
It's interesting how they respond. They usually tell me that Jesus was a moral, upright, religious leader, a good man, or some kind of prophet. I then share with them the claims Jesus made about himself, and then the material in this chapter on the trilemma, liar, lunatic, or Lord. When I ask if they believe Jesus was a liar, there's a sharp no. Then I ask, do you believe he was a lunatic? The reply is, of course not. Do you believe he is God? Before I can get a breath in edgewise, there is a resounding, absolutely not. Yet one has only so many choices. The issue with these three alternatives is not which is possible, for it is obvious that all three are possible, but rather the question is, which is more probable? Who you decide Jesus Christ is must not be an idle intellectual exercise. You cannot put him on the shelf as a great moral teacher. That is not a valid option. He is either a liar, a lunatic, or Lord and God. You must make a choice. But, as the Apostle John wrote, these have been written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and, more important, that, that believing you might have life in his name. That's John chapter 20, verse 31. The evidence is clearly in favor of Jesus as Lord. Some people, however, reject this clear evidence because of moral implications involved. They don't want to face up to the responsibility or implications of calling him Lord. That concludes chapter 2. So I'll, I will pick up chapter 3 next time. So that's kind of this, the, that last few paragraphs is kind of the summary, the conclusion. And so I guess this is a good time for me to ask you. I see Brother Bill's here now. Uh, uh, Brother Joe, why don't you give me your uh, your summary uh, remarks on this on the study today? Well, uh, you know, it, it's it's basic and simple math. You know, uh, it it just doesn't add up to uh, call Christ a good man who wasn't a liar and wasn't crazy, and then deny everything he said and did. It just doesn't it doesn't add up. It doesn't make sense. It brings me to the one of the commandments, uh, thou shalt not take the Lord, Lord thy God's name in vain. A lot of people call themselves Christians and yet deny the divinity of Christ. They're taking his name and denying who and what he is. Uh, so I would say that um, uh, we've talked about three possible options. Uh, and that is that Jesus was insane, or Jesus was a liar, a deceiver, uh, or he is who he claimed to be. But I believe that there is a, a fourth uh, option that people use. I, I, I don't believe it. Uh, I don't believe this is a, a, is a viable option. But this is the argument that you get from a Muslim, for example. They would say, well, uh, the Bible was tampered with, and it, it's corrupted. And Jesus didn't really claim to be God, and that was inserted. So the, the next question is, can we trust the Bible? And the Bible says uh, repeatedly that Jesus is God. The Bible, in the Bible, Jesus is himself is claiming to be God. So the only other way out of that would be like a Muslim, or some people will say, well, you know, Jesus never really said that. It's the Bible can't be trusted. And we will get into that in this tiny little book here. We will address the reliability of the Bible uh, as we go along. Uh, Brother Bill, how are you doing? Yeah, yeah, I'm doing good. Yeah, yeah. It's been one thing after another, after another, after another. And I managed to finally get in two minutes ago. So <laughs> bad timing, but yeah, it's been a bit of a nightmare. But I have been listening in intermittently and obviously hearing what everyone said since I got in here. So yeah, yeah, well, that's, that's Google Plus for you and, and that's, yeah. Well, I, I think I really know the, the, the real, the real uh, answer to, the, to that and that, that is that um, you uh, were waiting till the end 
so that you can present the gospel because you're an evangelist. So you, uh, the rest of the study is, you, you know that that doesn't rise to the importance as, as the gospel message. So you saved yourself so that you could be here in the end and give the gospel message. Is that, is that what you're really thinking? Well, yeah, you don't think you've caught me out yet. You've obviously got me there. <laughs> <laughs> I am glad you're here to, to, to do that for us. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. You probably didn't hear anything. You just last two minutes. But this was a very interesting study. Uh, we really, uh, the, this chapter two, the conclusion of chapter one, and we got all the way through chapter two today, and it was really uh, addressing this, this point that C.S. Lewis made, and that is that, uh, you only have these three choices. Jesus was either Lord God Almighty, or he was a liar or a lunatic. And we went through that very, very thoroughly. It was a very, very enjoyable study. So maybe when you have time, you can you can watch it back and make a comment on it. But uh, well, yeah, I was actually looking. Like I said, this is what I was really looking forward to. Believe it or not, the the liar, the lunatic, or or actually who Christ said who he is. And it's a pain that I've missed it, and I, and I definitely will rewatch it. Okay, uh, well, before we close and, and, and ask Brother Bill to uh, tell people the good news, uh, Brother Joe, any any, uh, any final thoughts? Yeah, I, I'm very disappointed because we were uh, discussing the possibility of uh, insanity and our resident expert would be Bill, uh, according to some, and uh, he wasn't here. So uh, I am glad he's able to present the gospel, though. No one does it better. All right. Uh, well, we have still Brother Ted, I think, here on the telephone. Uh, he, I'm sure he's been listening, but uh, maybe he's been multitasking. Uh, I, let me ask you to just give any final thoughts, if you if you want, uh, be, before we finish up for the day. Brother Ted? Sure. Sure, yeah. Well, I, I really appreciate these studies because uh, this is edifying to, to any Christian who's going to give these a listen, and they're so deep. Um, and the claims of Christ and the issue of the deity of Christ is one of my favorite subjects because this sets him apart from all the other, uh, you know, what the world would call, you know, religious leaders, you know, and uh, sets him apart from Muhammad, sets him apart from, you know, Buddha, Confucius, and, uh, you know, any of those other uh, false ways. Uh, and the claims of Christ and uh, the claims about his deity are something in scripture uh, that, uh, you know, I think I think one of the things people get hung up on, and I'll just make this kind of quick uh, since I didn't get to interject this earlier because of my uh, internet situation, but um, is uh, the, the, peop the people that get hung up on Jesus you know, just using the word God for himself. Well, he didn't have to. He didn't have to do that for one thing, because uh, you know he could do and say whatever he wanted. And he also said another place, "I only do and say the things that the Father tells me to do and say." But as you pointed out before, Luke, uh, one of the greatest uh, titles was "I Am." You know, and I think we were in that last last time, or a couple of a couple of chapters ago. Uh, but he would never use the Old Testament name of Jehovah. Yahweh for himself, uh, John 8, 58, uh, using the Old Testament name, I am, that God spoke to Moses from the burning bush, tell them, I am, have sent you. So um, I know we're going to get into those more in the chapters to come, but uh, I'm really looking forward to that. And uh, one of the things I, I'd like to bring in maybe next time or when I can join in fully is uh, the mutual titles or, or actions of uh, Jehovah in the Old Testament, you know, Almighty God, and the, and the same titles attributed to Christ uh, in Scripture as well. So we'll get into more of that. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, regarding all the different names and titles of Jesus, uh, uh, I, I did about a 10-hour teaching on that, a playlist called uh, The Identity of Jesus. And we went through Scriptures from Genesis to Revelation, all the different uh, titles and descriptions of Jesus so you could see that uh, uh, you can really really completely who he is um, so if you haven't seen that that's uh, that playlist uh, the identity of Jesus is on my channel uh, okay so brother Bill uh, 
it wouldn't do anybody any good at all to listen to these broadcasts and even just study it, read the Bible from, from beginning to end if they didn't uh, uh, get the one thing out of it that's really uh, of uh, uh, essential importance, and, and that is the good news about s salvation. So will you take a few minutes now and, and tell people the good news? Yeah, I will indeed. And, and to be honest, the good news is always an understatement. I know the gospel is the good news, but you know when when we've received this good news, and in and and the very Christ in whom this good news is wrought, it then becomes excellent news. And as ever, you know I have to if if you want the full counsel of God, I have to be honest, and I have to give you some bad news to to start off with, and the bad news is simply this, you know the Word of God declares, you know all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And sin literally does just mean to miss the mark. You know, God's perfect standard is here, okay? And to miss the mark is not to breach the mark. Now, if you're, if you're really, really, really extra holy, you know, you might get to there. But nonetheless, you know, the righteousness that you have managed to attain at this point are as filthy rags under God. And if you're like me, you're probably hovering about there, if, we're, if I'm honest. And unfortunately, the wages this sin is death, which is separation from a loving God. And, and, and an even further, bigger problem is there's nothing we can do about it. That is nothing within ourselves we can do about it. But thanks be to God, although all have fallen short of the glory of God, you know, all have basically sinned, and the wages of sin is death thereof, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ the Lord this day. And that is the best news in the world. It's not something we could earn, nothing we could attain by ourselves. We can't buy it. You know, we've heard in scriptures that, you know, Simon tried to obtain the gift and, and, and things. You just can't do it. You cannot get this gift. It has to be freely received because it is freely given. And this free gift today of salvation is through Jesus Christ alone. We must say that. And, you know, it's not through Buddha or Confucius or Muhammad or any other. It is only through Jesus. Jesus himself, you know, comes out of a bold statement and says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man come in front of the Father but by me. So salvation is only found in this Jesus. Like, and also later on the scriptures, you know, the apostles write, you know, neither is there salvation any other, for there's none under, name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. So there's a must, there's an essential element there. And that is through Jesus Christ. So now we know the bad news. Now we know who it's through. We now have to make a, a, a decision to, to choose that we accept this Christ and what he is offering us. And, and that is what we call, we call faith or belief or trust. And it is literally a complete trust in what this Jesus has said and what he is offering to us free grasses this day. The word even says, for by grace are you saved through faith. And that are not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So we know it is a free gift. Grace means un unmerited favour. It's something that is offered to us, you know, without, you know, us having to earn it or buy it or obtain it through some other means. So we know it's a free gift. We know it's by faith. And faith is literally putting all your trust into something. And this is what, you know, what all Jesus is requires is us just to believe on him and his promises. And his promise basically is everlasting life, eternal life. You know, Jesus himself says, verily, verily, which is definitely, definitely, I say you, he that, you know, believe on me, hath everlasting life. So the moment that someone simply believes on this Jesus, they have everlasting life, you know. And he goes on even later on and says, you know, verily, very I say you, hear that hear of my word, and believe from me sent me, hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but has passed from death unto life. So these these are wonderful promises from, from Christ himself. That the moment we believe on him, we literally do pass from death, which is obviously we're not going to be resurrected, we die, we die, to life, which is life everlasting. And it's free, and that is the best news in the whole world. But we must always realise that 
we have to believe on the real Jesus, the, the real Jesus that, that, you know, is throughout the scriptures, you know, concealed in the old and revealed in the new. We have to believe on this Jesus. And this Jesus is the actual Jesus that died for all of our sins. That's past, present and future. And he'd done this according to the scriptures. That he was buried, but then he rose again the third day in resurrection power. And that's what comes in. That's the hub of the, of the good news. That this Christ proved the day when he rose from the dead that he had power over life and death itself. And if we were to believe on him, and in those simple facts, you know, we too will be will risen also, come that day of the resurrection. You know, even Jesus proved, you know, when he when he did rise, you know, he didn't just suddenly rise and go straight up to heaven. No, he stayed on terra firma for a while, you know, and, and you know, he was seen by, by Mary Magdalene. You know, he was even seen, you know, by five hundred brethren. You know, so you know, and a lot of strange things happened. You know, when he was risen, so many proofs that of his resurrection that it's, it's almost embarrassing to, to not believe in it. But, you know, to, to be saved, if, if you want the simplest terms humanly possible, I have to always, and it is a literal wonderment within the New Testament and within the Holy Scriptures, of the example of the Philippine jailer. Okay, and, and I don't care if I even do this redundantly because it's such a glorious story that that and just just shows that beautiful simplicity that's in christ jesus how simple it is to be saved that i have to just keep 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 talking about it. but here I'll, I'll let the scenario unravel all right paul and silas they was arrested and they was put in jail and there was guarded by the philippine jailer and there was a mighty earthquake and, and all, all the shackles come off all the prisoners not just paul and silas but all the prisoners you know, that were in that prison. And, you know, any time they could have fled or escaped. At any time. But they didn't. And the thanks be to God they didn't, because we'd not have this story. But under Roman law, the jailer was in charge of all the prisoners. And if any prisoner escaped, you know, he he would have been sentenced to death. And, and so much so that this Filipino jailer knew this, that the moment the earthquake happened, the shackles fell off the prisoners, you know, he drew his sword and was just about to kill himself. All right? But then the apostle Paul and Silas said to him, paraphrasing this bit, you know, basically, don't kill yourself. We're all here. No one's escaped. Don't kill yourself. And he suddenly realized, and he, and he says to him, you know, he says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Not what could I do or should I do, or do I have to work for this salvation? He just asked them that essential question. What must I do to be saved? So right to the brass tacks. And I simply said to him, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. How simple is that? You know, that wipes out religionity. It wipes out every facade that we have, or, you know, what we think or assume of this Christ. And it just shows you exactly how simple it is to be saved this day. Just believe on that Jesus Christ this day and you will be saved. You will be part of that second resurrection because Christ was the resurrection. And that is, to me, that's the best news in the world. So simple, so easy, and it's so free. You know, and to be honest, and I don't mean to be disrespectful, but you've got to be completely mad to reject something like that. You don't often get things in life for nothing, but this is truly nothing. This is completely free, free gracious. Just believe on Christ and live this day. So I'd encourage anyone just to believe on the real Jesus, believe on his death, his burial, and especially his resurrection and the power thereof, and you will be saved this day. So I hope you'll do that, and God bless to anyone who does. That's the gospel over in a nutshell. All right. Thank you. All right. You said that you know you, it's absolutely free, and people say, "Well, there's no such thing as a free lunch. Nothing's really free." Well, the fact is, someone did pay for it. The Bible says that God paid for it with His own blood. Jesus' suffering, shed blood, and death on the cross paid for it, and He offers it to you freely. So put your faith in Jesus now, and. and 
uh, thank you uh, everybody for participating and we will pick up with uh, chapter three of this book uh, next time. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.